Hello, this is Brandon Kellum from American Standards. Dan Terra is not available at the moment, so I'll be your host for the evening. Enjoy. I'm pulling goddamn rank. We're not doing it. And if you believe that this is going to be the most laid-back episode of Discography Discussion... You're wrong! Then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. (laughs) I think between Jeff's sunburn, uh, Dan off becoming a father again, and Brandon hiding in a closet, this has the potential to be weird. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) You know, I mean, at this point, I really just think Dan's kind of slacking. I don't know if he has a commitment to the podcast that he once had. It's like, I'm having a kid. We get it. You have kids, Dan. Get on the podcast. Wasn't he having a kid at like 4 a.m. this morning? What is he doing right now is a question. Patience, gentlemen. The night is young. <laughs> Are we still on Baby Watch? It, uh, yeah, it hasn't happened yet. We are still on Baby Watch. So, yeah, she's got to be miserable because m- my wife went through 16 hours of labor on the first kid, and that was just hell. Oh. So, yeah, if she's if she was supposed to hit gosh what 10 hours ago 12 hours ago and it still hasn't happened so yeah i mean i I put it out there i was talking to him earlier and i I put it out there you know if it if it happens to to happen a little bit before the podcast or even during just feel free to jump on i'm sure (laughs) she'll be cool with it i i I uh, already offered i'm like you need to jump in and be like i'm a father and then jump out it's like all right that just happened during this podcast he did say, and I felt it was very, like, Always Sunny, like the title of the Always Sunny episodes. He's like, this episode could be called Brandon Kellum Host, Dan Gets Divorced. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so I'm yeah. looking forward to it. Once I get that text that he's ready to jump on, we can just patch him in, right? Absolutely. Yep. Good deal. Do we know, is it a boy or a girl? I, I that is a asked boy. I believe it's a boy. It is a boy. Can we announce uh, the name here on live uh, YouTube? If we knew what it was, we could. Oh, okay. Okay. So he's keeping it a secret here. Have you guys asked him or is he just like After the first one I never asked again and I kind of thought that maybe by number three they were gonna let it out a little early. Then they found out it was gonna be a boy and I said, No, he's gonna hang on to that one until it's over. <laughs> just to make sure. So Dan has shared a couple stories that uh you have a nickname in his house. Uh do you know what the nickname is? Uh you tell me which one he told you and I'll tell you if it's true or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, he prefaced it with the fact that you're an abusive uncle, maybe. I'm listening. <laughs> so so he said the, the nickname in the, the Dan house is uh, Scary Uncle Joe. That's absolutely true. <laughs> so does this mean you're going to be Scary Uncle Joe part three for the, the third kid here? I will be Scary Uncle Joe until I am Scary Daddy Joe, if that ever happens. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sweet. Sweet. Yeah, he that, says you give him a real hard time. So he says you basically act like they're big brother or something. I try to, you know. That's your that's your role is like the uncle is like to kind of be a general asshole all the time and then as soon as they get out of line just kind of pass them off to him right? Well, it depends on what the out of line is. Usually, but by the time that's happened, that's when mommy shows up and I'm like, I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Got it good, Dan. There are three. I can blame I can blame it on them. Nice, nice. Well, Brandon, since you are the guest and Dan is not present, I'm going to say, tell me all about System of a Down. Well, I do have to say, so, I, you know, I've been trying to keep up on you guys' podcasts, and uh, it's quite the investment. You guys go on for about, on average, what, 16 hours? You cut a few hours here and there. <laughs> uh, so I've got to tell you up front, I've only got about 50% of the battery on my phone. So uh, this won't be that 16-hour commitment that you guys might be used to. So feel free, free to pad it at the beginning and end, edit it however it makes it sound good, you know? You know. You know how I do. I'll be more like, I'll be like Chris Farley in the SNL skits where it's like, remember that time when like System of Down put out Toxicity? Toxicity? Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> uh, you know, the so, only reason why Scott, this episode with Scott was so long is because I was completely shit-faced and that was... 100% true. Yeah, it really is. That was terrible. I did one. see the pictures of the, uh, of you know, the counter full of beers and a fidget spinner that was hiding in the background. Oh, yeah, Would that's you totally care to comment just. on this fidget spinner, Joe? <laughs> uh, let's just say that it, it is effective for what it is designed for. And what it is designed for is keeping a person occupied when they are otherwise not occupied. So when you're sitting here for six hours waiting for a Pantera Spectacular episode to render, the fidget spinner comes in handy. That's what you do when Joe's talking the whole, or Dan's talking the whole time, right? Actually, yes. About- <laughs> if, you, if you ever watch the video and you catch a corner of me, I've usually got one. <laughs> I've yet to actually touch I've seen I mean, I've seen them all over the place any gas station you go to 
Like, I mean, the last tour we did, every single place we went to on the road, even the venues were selling them sometimes. Um, so I've seen them everywhere. I've yet to actually touch one yet. Like, I, I am kind of curious. So. The review of the fidget spinner that I got was there's something very soothing about sitting here and spinning this thing. And I just said, that can't be true. And then I did it. And I said, well, there's some truth to that statement. I don't know how effective it is at keeping you occupied, but I mean, I don't know. The best ones I've seen is some gal on Facebook used them as uh, pasties. I was like, okay, that's a good use for them. (laughs) Jeff's in at that point. (laughs) Yeah. You see those next level ones where they take like the cans of air and they set them on fire and they put daggers on them and all that stuff. So, Definitely uh, interesting how, uh, how far you can take it, you know. Before we get off on a tangent about fidget spinners, I'm going to say thank you to everyone for listening to this podcast. Thank you for liking and subscribing. We are on Google Play. We are on iTunes. We are on Stitcher. We are on TuneIn Radio. So if you have an Amazon Echo product, you can say to it, Alexa, play the latest episode of Discography Discussion, and she will. You can also find us on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Again, be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. You can find Brandon Kellum in the American Standards on Twitter at American Standards. And is it the Brandon Kellum on Amer- on Twitter? Uh, I believe it's just Brandon Kellum. How did you yeah. get your actual name? That's what I want to know. It, the, the Twitter username, it actually it took some time. I was uh, sitting there thinking, what should I be called? And Brandon Kellum just came to mind. I don't know how it happened. I mean, creative stroke of genius, if you ask me. I mean... <laughs> it, it's just the name that your mother gave you, right? I also like, uh, we should change the the band name from American Standards to Brandon Kellum and the American Standards. It's Is that the official the bill vibe. of the anti-melody now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Brandon exactly. Kellum, the Brandon Kellum and the American Standards present the anti-melody. Just add the nice in front it. of everything. Like it, like it. And this podcast is brought to you by Fidget Spinners. <laughs> American Standards branded Fidget Spinners. There you go. I have seen some bands take advantage of that already. I've seen the bands that have the fidget spinners with their logo in the middle. We we aren't going to get to that point. Uh, I'm just saying <laughs> you should get in while the getting is able to be gotten because I don't think it's going to be here much longer. Yeah, we might have missed the bus on it already. Yeah, you can. But uh, put it, you this can is also your, your time where you can say uh, people can donate on the Patreon, right, on a monthly basis. How do, I don't know how they do. How do you do that, Joe? How do I become a Patreon of discography discussion? Well, if you want, are not a patron, you can become one at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal. We have some sweet perks, usually in the one dollar, three dollar, five dollar range. If you are completely insane and you want to spend fifty bucks, well, there's some perks for you too, and. Very I would cool. be very appreciative and is a of perk, that. I, I heard, I mean, it might just be a rumor, so bear with me here. I hear once you guys hit a certain subscriber or a certain patron limit, um, you guys are going to actually do a End of Destiny reunion. Is that true? That has been talked about, although it is not officially endorsed. I, I just made say that, that up on the spot, so I think I got something out of you here. I, I think you did, because see, I would be willing to do it for at least $75. But that's me personally. I can't speak to the rest of the band. Is the rest of the band all there? Uh, I mean, I know obviously you and Dan are, but who uh, who else do we have in the band? I don't think we've talked about that. Well, if you want to talk about End of Destiny on your 50% battery, we can do that. Uh, that, that, <laughs> would be, uh, that would be uh, the Brian Colson, the Patrick Daniels, and the Michael Yanni. And all there in Missouri? And No, they're all nearby. Cool. Good walking well, distance. I mean, it sounds like it's not too far off. Let's get those seventy-five uh, or seventy-five dollars a month, not seventy-five subscribers or seventy-five patrons, right? I mean, I would just do it for seventy-five flat. Like if somebody gave me seventy-five bucks and asked me <laughs> to play a show, I'd make it happen. But again, that's just me. Cool. So my my goal of this is I want to sound really confident, like Dan, because I don't have all the history that he sounds like he has sometimes. Oh no, but he says Dan, it really Dan's confidently, so I don't know if he's ever telling the truth, you know. So I'm going to try to do that here too. So what do you know about? System of a Down, then, Brandon? Nothing at all, actually. I just started listening to their stuff yesterday. Seems I know right. that System of a Down <laughs> was the group that in OzFest, or Summer Sanitarium Tour 1996, somebody brought them up, and they were playing Sugar, and they said, these guys, they all have Armenian roots. Well, first it was, they're all Armenian. Then it's, well, they all have roots in Armenia. And then it was, they're a protest band. And I listened to it, and I was like, this sounds like some you know, Swami-type punk rock 
because it was all that Eastern flair in the melodies. Yeah. And, and then I'm like, okay, so that's what they are. And then they basically never changed their sound. They never changed their style. They kind of got presented a little more seriously. But as far as, like, something significant happened, no, I'm pretty sure they just kept recording albums about how negative they feel about America, which I think now would be an appropriate time for a reunion if that's the position that you want to take. Yeah, no, and I, I had the exact same finding from them. So I originally thought they were all all uh, from you know Armenia. I thought they all had those roots there, and then I find out they're from you know California for the most part. Um, so I kind of had that same introduction to them. Uh, so you said you first found out about them live at a concert, Summer Sanitarium tour. I believe it was 1996. It might have been 1998. I just it pops up. Here's this band, System of a Down, and they start playing Sugar, and it was nice. it was nice. it was clever. It was funny, you know. Serge was still kind of talky at that time, but he wasn't full on. I'm just going to stand here and talk at the microphone, which he did later. And I'm not going to say it was original. It was different than what was going on right then, because that was right in the middle of new metal, and you know. Yeah, you know, I do. I remember we talked about that. So when you guys came out to the American Standard Show uh, when we were out there in Missouri last, we had talked about is System of a Down actually a new metal band? And it's kind of, I mean, I think between System, we talked about System. I think System, to me, seems more clearly within the realm of new metal, but it definitely has, like you said, that unique touch to it. It has a ton of harmony um, and kind of those odd harmonies that uh, that kind of Darren and Serge switch off on, and. Um, and then I think we also talked a little bit about Rage Against the Machine if they fell in that same bucket of new metal. So, so would you would you agree they are in the new metal realm, or would you classify them as something else? Not anymore. I think they are a rock band, or a really I would I would call them a punk band at times that just kind of stem into metal and heaviness. I really yeah. don't have a good label for them because I'd call them like poppy alternative metal i don't know what else to call it. alternative metal might be the best one because you know if you listen to their first record which is just the self-titled system of a down the first thing that most people heard with spiders and sugar you know you get these really clever kind of upbeat riffs that are just they're very chromatic they're not very diatonic for you music junkies that's he can play whatever note he wants and make it sound good and it never really changed. I, I, my, my, I'm going to sneak my final thoughts in at the beginning because that's how I like to write all my thesis papers. <laughs> the, the first thing they did is the thing that they kept doing. It peaked around toxicity and then it just kind of got repetitive after that. But I mean, really, they've only got three records. You have the first record, Toxicity. You have the B sides off of Toxicity, which is Steal This Album. Yep. And then yep. you have Mesmerize, Hypnotize, which I don't care what anybody says, that's one record. Yeah, yeah, and it's released in the same year, too, so... Yeah, the total running time is 59 minutes on the whole thing. It's like, well, this is just one album of really, really good music, but... Although something that was interesting about that is, and I was kind of, like, trying to do a little research, trying to be professional, you know, like Dan and everything. I, I always say, what would Dan do when I'm approaching a podcast? And uh, He prefers and that it was, that way. <laughs> and between Memorize and Hypnotize, they re- released them both in 2005. Kind of a little fun tidbit I found out about that was they kind of fall into this group of uh, artists, and there's very, very few that released albums that went to the charts and ranked at number one in two albums consecutively in the same year. The only other people that had done that was the Beatles, Guns N' Roses, uh, was it Tupac, and strangely DMX. So outside of that, no other artist has released two number one albums within the same year. And because they released Memorize and Hypnotize the same year, and like you said, they arguably could be one album, but released as two albums, uh, they kind of fall into this weird group of only five artists that kind of achieved that. Well, as one as one of the uh, groups that I respect the most for, you know, getting in and getting out, um, you have talked about the American Standards songs being quick because why hang around when you got the point get to the point and move on to the next one S- system of a down is like two minutes in two minutes out there you go yeah, yeah. They, they might have that one song on the album that's a little bit longer than the rest but for the most part yeah keep it under two minutes don't don't bore me giving you your best stuff right and I actually just like you I um, I think around 2000 maybe a little bit later that's when I first heard the self-titled album 
and everyone saw them at like an Ozfest. Uh, and you know, they yeah, they just nailed through that full first album and thought, wow, this is so. It, although yeah, and it, it was categorized with bands like Corn and, and stuff like that, but it was so different for the style of vocals and the guitars. I mean, it's one guitar band. It's not there. Although I think uh, Darren kind of does a lot of layering and stuff like that. There's not a lot of bands uh, from that genre that were just doing that one guitar, um, you know, bass vocals and and then tons of harmonies like that. Well, let's talk about the first record then, because first record is got Rick Rubin's hands all over it. Yep. Everything is in mono. It's right down the middle. There's no layering to speak of. It's just this is what the band sounds like when they all stand together and play. Highlights yeah. for me are Sugar, Spiders, Pluck, because it's Pluck, and maybe Soil. But you've got 13 tracks. Just turn the thing on, let the whole thing go, and get out of there. It's, I mean, it hits you right from the beginning with uh, Sweet Pea when it comes in with those like uh, the little harmonics, the artificial harmonics, wherever they are, or natural harmonics, actually, just going up and down. It's, it's such a cool song. I think that first song, Sweet Pea, is actually my favorite song on the album. You think so? Um, I do, I do. And then actually looking into it a little bit, that you mentioned Soil, I, I didn't realize that uh, originally Serge and Darren had a band prior to System of a Down, which was called Soil. Yes, they did. Um, so I'm kind of... Yeah, I'm kind of curious going back and seeing if any of that stuff is uh, easy to find online because, uh, I mean, I, not only did I not know that, but I didn't know that Shavo, the bass player, was originally the manager of the band. And then John on drums uh, was actually someone that branched off and went over to Apex Theory, which when I try to categorize other bands, because there's not a lot of bands that I really point to that sound like System of Down, like Apex Theory for some reason always sounded a little bit similar to it or somewhere within the same realm. Um, but I had no clue that John was from Apex Theory. I didn't know that either, so thank you for that little tidbit of information. Yeah, didn't the, um, the original drummer from System of Down go over to... Apex Theory, if I'm not mistaken, and I think Apex Theory is also another full Armenian. Uh, yeah, band didn't didn't as well. the drummers switch places or something like that? I do know that the guy who was originally with uh, System of a Down uh, became the drummer on uh, with a with Apex Theory, but I'd have to I'd have to cheat and look yeah, that yeah. up. To, to no, I, I think you're right, and I think that's the only guy in the band that's really. Um, since they were called System of a Down, like officially, I think that the drummer uh, is really the only guy that had. Uh, left the band. That's right. It was yep. um, Andy, and I'm going to butcher his last name, but that's what I do. Uh, Andy <laughs> Kachaturian. Kachaturian. Well, Jeff just went right ahead and nailed that because thank you. It, it, He's a professional. <laughs> back when back when they were Soil, that's 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 who their drummer was, and right before they became System of a Down and got signed, that's when John came over. And so did you guys have you guys heard Soil at all or have you guys listened to any of the tracks? Because I, I personally haven't heard them at all. I've never heard it. I've never taken the time to look it up. Uh, I have, but that was in we'll have to dig into the pure volumes or whatever was around back then. Yeah, this was early two thousands when I did it because there was a somebody at college that was a huge system of a down fan. And In played, that case it may be like on an Angel Fire, like a Geo City <laughs> site, right? Hey, I didn't know you read my Zanga. <laughs> no, there's a, we had a search engine on, on campus called Seek Forty Two. And that's how we nice. that's how we used to get it. <laughs> Is that like Napster before Napster? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, so well now it's called Missouri S and T, but back then it was University of Missouri Rala. And uh, yeah, Seek Forty Two. That's how you got that's how you got your music. Very nice. So it was, it was very cool. Since it was an engineering uh, engineering college, they had they were pretty far ahead of times as far as like how you were able to get access to everything. So Seek Forty Two pretty much acted like uh, iTunes. So it was pretty cool. Hmm. Interesting. So Jeff, what's his? Joe mentioned his favorite songs from this. What's what's your favorite songs off this album? Actually, you hit one of them, and that's 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 Sweet Pea. Everybody loves Sweet Pea. It's a good way to start. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I like the Kicks harmonics. Kicks in the balls right in the beginning, right? Yeah, and and I, I'm just like you. I I love the the harmonics and it, the, the tonals on that that kind of stuff. That I always dig it. And I mean, of course, you know. Everybody likes sugar. That's just a little too goofy for me, I guess. I really like spiders, and I like uh, yeah. what was it? People. That one was kind of weird. People is so a good one too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, actually, I remember. I really, um, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, sorry, not to cut you off, but I remember actually listening to uh, or seeing that video for 
for Sugar the first time, and this is you know when MTV was actually playing music videos, and, and I didn't have cable as a kid, so we used to have this thing called the box, and it was kind of like when you flip through the channels, and there'd be those staticky channels, and you oh, know everybody had the jokes box and too. says, "That's awesome." Oh, really? Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, you like it was a kind of a staticky channel here. It was like the one where you like you always like as a kid joke and say you see like a boob here and there because it's all <laughs> staticky. <and kinda laughs> We, we, we had, you know, the box would play music videos, but the I think if I if, uh, if I remember right, it was like you can call in and pay for them to play a certain video or something, like queue it up. And I would never pay for it, nor did I do like credit card or anything to do so. So me and my friends would just stay up late at night watching the box and waiting for two videos to come on. One would be Sugar Fry System went Down, and the other was always falling away from me by corn. And we're just like, it'd be like 1 a.m., you know, friends would just be hanging out. We're like, come on, hopefully they play those two videos. Now we think, wow, this, you could pull up any video on YouTube, watch 20 seconds of it, get bored, and pull up another video. Yeah, it's exactly like my kids. <laughs> That's <laughs> what they do. No, I th- yeah, we were, we had we had um, the box. It was like some UHF channel that, like you said, you, you could never quite get it in good. Yeah, you'd be like, ah, oh, the box is coming in good tonight. I'll watch it for a little bit, you know? Yeah, we used to, like, at my friend's house, we'd literally sit on the edge of his bed and have all we hold his uh, his antenna, so th- <laughs> there'd be like four or five of us in the room, and like we'd sh- trade off. I mean, I know that sounds cheesy and probably sounds like it should be on that '70s show, but we it's re- just like a kids will never know the struggle moment. Yeah, I know. We re- but we really did do that. We were we we were trying our damnedest to try to hold the antenna just right to make sure that we could we could actually at least understand what the hell is going on. Yeah, and we yeah, get pissed cool. off when somebody would like move or like. Stop moving! We're, we're trying to watch this. <laughs> Silly humans! <laughs> it's coming over the cable connection. <laughs> so yeah, that was that was my introduction to uh, to System of Down. Was I think originally seen it on the box? I saw Sugar, and then uh, and then we went and saw him at Ozfest when uh, when that album was still you know I think the only thing they had out back then. And was it 98, 99? 98, I think is when that came out. What do you yeah. think of, is the overall appeal of System of a Down? See, I, I have a conundrum that goes on in my brain where there was a period in my life where I spent some time around armed forces enlistees, and I cannot understand how a band that's supposed to be a protest band is so beloved by the armed forces. <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I mean, I can't answer that, but I personally feel it was two things for me. I think um, it was just so weird. The way that uh, that Serge and, and even Darian doing the... Uh, the backing vocals kind of phrase everything it it creates these like little hooks and little things that get stuck in your mind um, i mean i mean just the way he says sugar for example is just that sugar it, like kind of just this, this, this little weird phrasing that they do things that like be create these hooks within the hooks you know and that that was something that was interesting to me and and i also think is at the time that i got into it was when i got my first guitar and uh once again i should probably tell you i, I only wanted to do this episode that way i can uh openly talk smack about Dan and not liking Pantera and uh, how Pantera is <laughs> the greatest band ever. So at that time, I only listened to bands like Pantera and I could never play guitar like Pantera. But when I heard of System of a Down and I was looking up to the tabs, I like, I can play this. You know, this is stuff that's easy. I remember learning like that self-titled album in Toxicity and it was just very accessible, you know. So it had that weird kind of almost creepy vibe that tied me in first. But then also from a musical standpoint, it was just something that was... Uh, got me into actually playing guitar you know and learning stuff although it was just you know power chords and, and fairly simple stuff everything in the drop c but i mean to this day i think i mean american standards even plays in drop c so uh that was another thing that was like that drop tuning like right below that drop d it was just something different than uh than we were used to what about you guys i mean what, what why would you think that they would kind of uh have that appeal uh i i think for uh at least it was for me was they um, were a little more upbeat even if you know the the message may not you know whenever they got serious on, on some of the stuff that they wrote i mean it was you know some pretty heavy subject matters you know they had a they were quirky they had a, you know there was a little bit of fun involved and, and and for me that was kind of the appeal was you know hey this isn't your your typical normal you know because this is right at the end of grunge and new metal was coming in you know 
Yes. So this was this was more fun, and it, and, it, and, yeah. and, and it had a had a poppy feel to some of their stuff. Fun is the word I would definitely use to describe System of the Down. And, and I th- yeah, no, yeah. I like that. I like that. I mean, I think like you said, I mean, it, it it made it like it took away the tough guy aspect that some of the heavier music was doing, and a lot of the bands, especially in new metal, were doing like this more dark and angsty kind of feel to it. And although like they had some of the, those visuals, it just seemed. It seemed weird, but it didn't seem like tough guy. It seemed like, like you said, just fun is, I mean, probably the best word. Just kind of this weird, spazzy type of uh, upbeat stuff. Spaz. That's a good word, too. That's a, <laughs> it's fun and spastic. You know, I don't know if maybe their um, their Armenian roots has something to do with it, too. I, I know that... They would tell you that it does. Outside of Darren, they were all... None of them were born in the U.S. Uh, Darren was the only one, and his 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 dad immigrated from, I think it was from Iraq, because he's I know his dad's a pretty famous artist, and his dad actually did the covers for Hypnotize and Mesmerize. That's actually his dad's art. On, Interesting. Oh, nice. On yeah. those and, uh, but yeah, so I I I I think culture might have something to do with it too. I mean, it's kind of the reason why I I always liked. Um, I mean, I might get shit for it, but I like. Uh, whenever Seether first came out, I really liked them because they had a different, you know, I felt like they had a different vibe or different feel because they were from South Africa. So they had a different, you know, a different perspective on things. And, and I think that's mm. part of the reason why I liked, you know, System of a Down. And then it, I actually, uh, I started, uh, they, you know, they, they got their point across. I actually started looking into the Armenian genocide, which is kind of what they wanted. You know, that's, that's kind of like their big thing. That was the whole point. Yeah. The yeah. origin of the band was... Pay attention to this. Yeah, and it, it is. Yeah, I mean, it's anybody who hasn't looked into it needs. Uh, they, they should. I mean, the, you want to talk about one of the greatest atrocities that, that's that's happening in modern times. I mean, that 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 really is it. I mean, it, and the fact that people don't hear about it is yeah, is that just, was under the rug. Yeah, and and what band really got or or artist really got kids that were like in junior high and high school to dig into stuff like that like system of down did right i mean there i mean you could say like rage against the machine maybe but outside of that there weren't really a lot of artists that made kids that young really care about something that much right correct they they might be a sleeper smart band like the b52s and devo were always accused of being a smart band like you had to pay attention to actual facts in order to really appreciate the music and yeah rage they were definitely like pay attention to this this is actually going on and system of a down the same thing yeah and something too about system of a down is i i think a lot of the time i mean maybe uh, maybe it's depending on how much you really dig into the lyrics but i think a lot of the time it wasn't so overtly in your face and so like if you didn't really um if you didn't want to have that kind of pushed upon you or you didn't want to to take from it something that heavy like it wasn't always at the forefront in some songs i mean i mean i know we'll probably talk about obviously going into toxicity and stuff but some songs like prison song i mean it's just right there at the forefront but other songs like like sugar or like spiders i mean i don't know that uh unless you're really digging that you might not know the actual meaning of the song so um i don't think it was like so preachy um, from just hearing the songs, you know, obviously as you start learning more about the band, that's when you, that's when you really understand that's kind of the underlying theme of all of it. Right. Yeah. And I also think the further they got into it, the more overt they were with, uh, yeah. with, with what they had to say. I think they were, you know, just scratching the surface at the beginning. And I think that's kind of, you know, I guess that's not too surprising. They're, they're, they're afraid of not being able to, I don't know, Get signed to a big label or something of that nature. It, you know, if they if they put if something they're not established too far, first, right? I mean, I because I can, you know, I think Rage Against the Machine is kind of like the uh, the anomaly. They're the only ones that could come out and you know straight off the get go, just in your face. I mean, because even you no know, real popular pop punk bands like like Green Day, for example, you know, the further they got along, they really got political. Incubus got political. I mean. All these bands, you know, after they were established, then they would, you know, say, okay, this is how I really feel. And it would take a while. Uh, and and I, I think uh, System of Down was kind of, you know, the same way. I mean, you, you, there's kind of a, uh, a proven path on if you want to actually have a political, you know, sw- swing to your, your lyrics that, you know, if you, you got to tread lightly at first. And then once you got an established fan base, then you, you can go full bore. 
Yeah, it's like at that point, once they've established themselves and they've built some influence, then they can kind of, like you said, start saying some of the things more uh, straightforward and less hidden in the middle metaphor because, uh, right. you know, they're not as worried that people will drop off the horse because of uh, because of their views. Correct. I, I, I definitely agree with that. Cool. I like it. So that kind of brings us into the next one, right? Into uh, toxicity. Speaking yeah. of the next one. <laughs> Toxicity is, I would say... 2001, right? Yes, it is. And I would say... I don't think you're cheating. Uh, It might (laughs) might be. Toxicity, I think, is the peak of System of a Down. I think it's the best songs performed by the band as a whole. The album is a killer from start to finish. When it came out, it was huge. I know people that treated Toxicity like the best album that had been recorded by a band in 10 or 12 years and it was just their second record and yeah it it had that almost like like lincoln park had with hybrid theory i think it brought a lot of people that were completely out of the metal uh genres uh, or realm into this type of music you know you people that were into rap and and other types of music would would know like toxicity or chop suey Chop Suey especially because this is the record that I point to when somebody, whoever they may be, pops up and says, I've never listened to System of a Down. I give them toxicity. I say, listen to this. This is the band. And unfortunately, while I think that Mesmerize and Hypnotize are the peak of Darren's songwriting, because the majority of the music is written by Darren throughout the entire especially band. Especially at the period. end there. Yeah, especially with Memorize and Hypnotize. That was right. almost all primarily him. And that, that is the peak of his songwriting. It is not the peak of this band. Toxicity is, this is everything we did before and everything that we're going to do coming up. Just done, just turn the volume up a little bit. This is where the guitar layering comes in, the different vocal melodies, the, the feeling and the fun because I put this record in, the first thing I hear is prison song, and it's clearly a political song about the prison system in America, to quote Serge's lyrics. But then I got to Needles, and I was on board as I was falling on the floor laughing while listening to what at first listen was ridiculous, and I'm going to pull a Dan, because the lyrics are, I cannot disguise all the stomach pains and the walking of the canes when you do come out and whisper up to me in your life of tragedy. Okay, well, what is this about? But I cannot grow till you eat the last of me. Oh, when will I be free? You, a parasite, just find another host, another fool to roast, because you, my tapeworm, tells me what to do. And then he just starts chanting, pull the tapeworm out of your ass. Hey, you know how hard it was for me right there not to just start singing along with you, Joe. I I, I would have laughed if you if you had. <laughs> we could have just quoted it together. Here, here, let's try this, Brandon. You know, pull, pull the tapeworm out, out of your, your ass. ass. Hey, pull the tapeworm out, out of your ass. ass. Hey, no, that I, that that album is so great in the sense that like if I go to a bar and they have like a jukebox that could touch tunes and I play a System of a Down song and if it's off Toxicity, the second that song ends. I'm already naturally singing the next song that's on that CD because I just remember listening to it from front to back so many times that like you remember the track listing, you know like all the words, you know how one song blends to the other. It's a uh, it's great. And it might be the only record of theirs that I still enjoy just putting in on its own. I mean, yeah, it's all good. Needles, Deer Dance, Jet Pilot, Chop Suey. Shimmy, one of my favorites still. And actually, I think Shimmy is one of the ones that Serge wrote the music. But as I said, the majority was done. But this is also where my complaints start. Because everything on Toxicity is kind of a reworked version of something that they did on the self-titled. And the biggest example of that is Spiders. And I think it's... Is it uh, Aria? Oh, yeah, yeah. Or Ottawa. Right? Or Ottawa. I think, sorry. Oh, okay, Ottawa, yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's just the same thing again, only we did it a little bit differently. And that's, yeah, that's that's a criticism of any band. You know, every fan wants the band to come out and do the exact same thing they did the first time. Well, if that's what you're into, this is exactly what they did the first time, only better. 
<laughs> well, yeah, I mean, better might be argu- uh, arguable, but I will, like... I am prepared me, to argue that point. To, <laughs> it's here, yeah, we'll just do a whole other uh, 12 rounds on it. Or, but um, for me, it's hard to separate the nostalgia from the songs um, or from the albums because I say, personally, I think self-title is my favorite, but that's the thing that got me into it. It's got all the nostalgia. It, it changed my entire view of music. Um, but I will absolutely agree that as you go into Toxicity, they polished it. Their their uh, choruses are catchier. It's it's you know more intricate musically. Um, I think everything they did on Toxicity was better from purely the musical standpoint. Um, but there's just uh, an aggression and an intensity with self-titled um, that may only be with me because of the uh, the nostalgia for it. You know, absolutely. And this is one of those albums that when you listen to it, you can tell the guitarist wrote the music and clearly he had time to play around because stacks and stacks of guitars and of course the record that I bought and the, every one I've ever seen comes with it, one of those uh, late 90s early 2000 DVDs about the making of the album and you just see him just 20 plus guitars and he's just stacking and stacking and stacking and it makes it sound big but not big like you know power metal or things like that it's just this is just more and more aggressive more and more fun i feel like and i've been trying to avoid it but it's it's come out it's another one of those i feel like i'm at the circus it's the it's that damn clown circus thing sneaking in again that just makes it feel fun yeah you know there's something that can be said about this album that you don't have from self-titled is the more you listen to it because of all those layers and because of all the textures they put in with different amps and different guitars and um, even things like mandolins and stuff like that. Every time you listen to it, you can hear something different. You can hear something different in the the background or in the textures of it or a different tone um, that you might not have heard the time before, especially when you've got the headphones in. Um, When you listen to self-titled, it's, it's just there. It's it, it, like you said, it's just all, laying it all out as it is you know with with toxicity there's and that's probably why it's withstood the you know the test of time because there's so much there to find um just by listening to it is there a standout track on here brandon for you or is it mostly all gold? you know i think they they start their album strong sweet pea was for the first one i think this prison song is one of uh, my favorite on, on this one which is what they started off with as well um, just, just like I think Jeffy said, it's it was it's cool that in prison song they they were able to say something or or actually Joe you're saying this they 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 had like the statement about the war on drugs, but it also it had still that fun feel to it that fun vibe and kind of like I was saying at the beginning it has those like inflections in the vocals that just make it like you know completely unique to them. I think System of Down is one of the few bands that if anybody tried to to um do something similar to them especially vocally they would just be a system of a down ripoff band um we've heard a million bands that have tried to sound like uh like Azalea dying or or insert other metal or metalcore band um and and it's hard to distinguish which one kind of started it but with system of a down i think if someone tried to do what they did um especially with toxicity it would be just a system of a down ripoff band and i can't think of any bands that have tried to do it you know not successfully. I've heard a couple locals and a couple underground here and there that's like, well, our biggest influence is System of a Down, and it was just the vocalist standing there yelling. But he wasn't trying yeah. to do Surge Tankarian. He ended up sounding more like me without you, which just oh. makes me laugh because I'm like, uh, dude, you're listening to the wrong band. Here, go listen <laughs> to this. And uh, I almost can separate this album into three acts, and I don't know if they did that on purpose, but I'm also like a diehard track listing guy. I think that if you put the tracks in the wrong order, it doesn't flow right. And this is one you may be the last of a dying breed of that, Joe, because now that everybody's listening on Spotify on random, you know, you don't have that same art form. You know, back when a record was a record, you had to figure out what the flow was. And, you know, this one from Prison Song through X, I kind of feel like is one thing, almost like X is an intermission. Chop Suey through Ottawa, I feel like that's another thing. And then you get to Science all the way through Psycho. And Ariels, which Ariels and Ottawa, I typically get confused in my brain. It, it, they almost feel like three different acts, three different sections of a composition, which if that's what they were going for, props to you, Darren, because you're a freaking badass. Uh, it's all gold. I can't pick one out that I, I dislike. In fact, if I had to pick one that I think is just 
if I had to pick one, if you told me you you have to get rid of one track, I'd throw away X. Why? Because I can't remember what it is until I hear it. The rest of them, they're gold. Was Bounce on this album? Yes, it was. Yes, it is. Bounce is such a fun song, too. And, you know, actually, as I was kind of looking into it and listening back to the old uh, albums, one thing that I saw that was I thought that was hilarious is since they used that song for that new movie that uh, was it, The Secret Life of Pets. Yep. Have you guys seen the the previews for that? Yes. Yes. So the, they used this song, Bounce, in there. And apparently at the time when they used it in there, Universal Pictures didn't know that there's so many references to that song to, like, you know, sexual intercourse and orgies. Um, <laughs> but by that time, they had already put it as that scene with, like, the chihuahua banging his head to bounce. Yep. Um, so they couldn't pull it. And I thought that was hilarious. I'm sure they were laughing all the way to the bank when they cashed that check. Well, I remember when I saw that and my first thought was, well, it's a it's a classically trimmed poodle in a rich home and his owner's gone and as soon as bounce comes on everybody shows up to the party and i'm like clearly that's an inside joke that nobody was paying attention to and i'm a terrible person because i caught it yeah you know and that, it makes me wonder yeah if, you, if it is an inside joke that the, the writers of it kind of were in on but you know i wouldn't going be surprised back up if to, that's the case yeah like up the ranks maybe no one else caught on to it but uh <laughs> And in the same thing, I mean, there's a lot of sadly a lot of kids that probably have never heard that song. They've heard they've heard some of the singles or they've heard or they've heard the name, but they they definitely wouldn't know that that song is about what it is. I just remember going to, over to my friend's house and me, her sister, and a bunch of other people. We would just sit listen to Toxicity, and anytime Bounce came on, the dudes would be doing the skank, and the girls would literally be bouncing up and down on bouncy balls. And I'm like, y- you're all 16 and you have five year old toys. Come on. <laughs> and this is another the song's probably like a minute or a minute and a half if I remember right not even it's about four yeah I think yeah. the quickest one on here is Shimmy it's a solid minute 51 according to my iTunes nice <laughs> So uh, I'm wondering I'm curious on uh, so this album toxicity it obviously came out during the time of like uh, September 11th I think like right either, right before or right after there right after do you think it. that played into um, any of the uh, any of the either popularity or I don't know that you can argue that it made it suppress it at all outside of the fact that I, I heard that they were actually pulling like the uh, the song from radio in some cases. But it's interesting that despite the fact they're pulling it from radio, this album was so huge. How do you think it uh, affected it? I don't think it affected it commercially, seeing as how it's one of the most successful records of that time frame and the band has lasted as long as they did, at least in people's minds, even though they went away for a while. Um, there was a lot of groups, Power Man 5000 comes to mind, that got songs pulled from the radio. And I think it benefited System of a Down because they would go out and play in support of everybody. And I know I asked the question earlier, like, why is this band so big with the military? Well, the answer is because they were one of the bands that would go out and just play. <laughs> it wasn't about the politics at that point. It was, let's get you hyped up. Let's get you, you know, back into it because that was a time frame in this country, as I recall, where everybody was banding together in the way that you wish they would in in the dreams of, of Mice and Men. And I remember Toxicity being one of the strong albums. It, it stands out to me, at least in that, that year, or for the next few oh, yeah. years, it stands out. Yeah, I, I think the fact that it was, well, you know, it was more upbeat than some of the other new metal. I mean, it's the same reason why bands like, you know, POD and Switchfoot and all that kind of stuff got real popular at the same at, at that time is because they they seem to have a, a positive message and a positive vibe. Uh, a lot of the other stuff that fell by the wayside after 9-11 I think was stuff that was a little bit more darker and depressing. People were looking for things that they could feel good while listening to because they needed to because you know life would kind of sucked for a lot of people because you know you know the, either they were affected directly by it or, or indirectly by it but you know most people had some sort of emotional reaction to 9-11 and so anything they could get to either a make them feel better or b forget about it altogether i mean they were going for it so i i think that i think that helped system of madame quite a bit especially yeah. with like you know chop suey it's, you know i don't think it's an accident that that became so so popular because it's just so at the time it was quirky offbeat weird and it, it the video was was really weird especially with darren like all you know with the the painted on tattoo he had and, and him kind of going in all different directions all at the same time in the video i mean i know that 
I know a lot of people that you know they love that kind of stuff because it was just something it was something that they hadn't seen before and it was something that they get their mind off of things absolutely yeah like I said I mean it was one of the bands I remember um, and this is I think uh, like the tail end of high school that there were a lot of, for me at least uh, that there were a lot of people that uh, that never would have listened to this type of music but like it completely opened the doors for them like between that and hybrid theory which i think was somewhere around this time i don't know, maybe a couple of years before or after probably after right um but th- those are the kind of like the transitional bands that just got these people into it because it was on the radio and it was different and it was quirky you know and if anything i mean uh especially for for you know kids in uh, junior high and high school um if they heard that something got pulled from the radio or if they heard that something was um what's the word uh if they heard for any reason that people were trying to suppress it, I guess th- that might make more lure to like actively want to go out and, you know, find it and like it anyways. Uh, I know a few people that, that that was the mindset and still is to a certain extent where it's it. What is this? People don't like it. I shouldn't be listening to it. I have to hear it. Yeah, that's the same yeah. reason why if the kid's under 21. No, you cannot drink. Bullshit. What? <laughs> I'm going to go drink. Give I mean, him time. I mean, He'll on. figure it out. <laughs> well. Now, so what you're saying is for American standards, our only successful or our, our only chance of success is if we start telling people not to listen to us or not to come to our shows because it's uh, no, what it's you need. too risque. Brandon, no, since you, the you, day you, I met you, you've been telling me not to listen to your band. And, and we drove across the state. <laughs> yeah. Come on. You need to find a way to have their parents tell the kids that. And then you're then you're in <laughs> like Flynn. Your mom says don't listen to American standards. Just saying. <laughs> perfect it's perfect i love it you know there's two other things i because i tried to like i said i tried to look up uh some stuff about the albums and there's two things i didn't know at all about this album that i thought were kind of interesting and i they might have been huge at the time and i just didn't, didn't realize but i read that they were uh when they were doing their album release show for this in california for for toxicity that um i guess they they did it at some outdoor place that was supposed to hold like three or four thousand people and like ten thousand people ended up showing up so by the time System of Down was supposed to get on stage, the cops were already like trying to break it up and saying the show wasn't going to happen. And apparently, and it had a few sources. It was on Wikipedia, but it had a few sources, so it's possibly legit. Sources um, are important, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly. Apparently, they're saying like people started rioting and they ended up destroying you know over thirty thousand dollars worth of gear and stuff on the stage and everything, which. I mean, thirty thousand dollars worth of gear probably isn't really that much. That sounds like uh, the gear from a small venue, but uh, just the uh, the whole fact that there's ten thousand people to see, you know, this album release show for their probably their breakout album is huge. And they sold. I mean, they sold. What this went multiple times platinum, which is crazy. Platinum being like back then, like you had to sell millions of albums, so they were doing like ten, twelve million al- albums. Yeah, to, ten, uh, ten million is is diamond, I believe. <laughs> now, yeah, now it's like, dude, if you can sell like. 10,000 albums. <laughs> it's huge. It's all about singles online. Yeah. From what I've been told. How many listens do you get on Spotify or crap like that, unfortunately? I know yeah, I, I yeah know true. That, that doesn't pay. Does that pay yet, Brandon? It's a fraction of a penny. We get a check for about 20 bucks a month from Spotify. Nice. And I, I truly think it's like 0.01 of a penny for every play. So it's, it's pretty low. You got to make your money while out on tour unfortunately i would have guessed it's all touring it's all merch you, you buy a t-shirt for a few bucks and then hopefully you get 10 or 15 for it you know but yeah so that that was one thing that i thought was interesting another thing that i thought was interesting once again a uh, um something that was sourced on wikipedia so take it with a grain of salt <laughs> but uh it was talking about that song that uh, uh i-e-a-i-e-i-o song we're getting uh, to that. Yeah, that's on yeah. uh, Steal This Album, oh, I think. Oh, is that on Steal This Album? All right, yeah. well, well, I'll save it for that. That's a teaser. Well, why don't we just move, the break. Why don't we use that as our segue into it? Well, here, here's, <laughs> the, here's the thing about Steal This Album. Here was 2002. I remember 2002. We still had dial-up internet. Napster was no longer a thing, but this is where peer-to-peer became a thing. BearShare, LimeWare. BearShare, LimeWire, Morpheus, Kazaa. It was the same software with a different name, if you remember, Jeff. (laughs) Yes, it was. And, (laughs) you know, when you looked at somebody's CD collection, a lot of people had a large stack of CDRs. And I don't mean CDRs that you go to the store now and buy. I mean, back when they were a little bit of higher quality, the labels were very white. I remember Memorex being my favorite CDR design. It was this deep blue color. I don't believe that has anything to do with the longevity of it, but it had this really nice white label like it had been painted by hand. It said Memorex on it. CDR. If you had to rewrite it, it had RW. 
And is that what you gave to the girls after you made a really nice mix album? I oh, yeah. <laughs> was a notorious mix CD maker, and uh, there are some people that to this day have my mixes in their collection. And I, am I not gave that girl a Memorex. I did actually. She would <laughs> she would prove it if she if. Hang on, like let me call her. Hang on, you still have that Memorex. <laughs> but I saw this album in the store. Steal this album is what it was called, and it was clearly a mockery of people stealing music online and the story that i read whether it's true or not was that this was the b-sides off toxicity so they had if we are counting here which i'm trying to do fast to make myself sound you know somewhat articulate that means that they recorded 30 songs for toxicity totaling less than two hours brandon this is right up your alley i think as far as song i love it that's why i love it but here it was sitting in the store. It just said, steal this album. And I looked at it and I said, well, it looks like a CDR. My copy that I bought came in a clear case with no booklet. Already Dan's pissed off because there's no lyrics. There's no you know production notes. <laughs> it literally looked like a CDR in a case. And I finally just looked. I said, I'll take it. I take it home. First thing I hear is chicken stew. And if, if it's... If it's possible for a fun band to just go goofy, these songs are goofy. And not very many of them stand out as good. Like, well, I think of Chicken Stew. I think of ADD. I think of I. Fuck the System was one of my favorite. And uh, Mr. Jack was a good one for a slower jam. Yeah, 100%. I but, liked Inner Vision. That's probably my favorite on yeah, there. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's what I'm talking about, though, with this band. It's all the same thing that they did on the other records and i don't even i'm i'm skeptical to call this a record if they didn't call it a record i wouldn't because well it's the b-sides from the toxicity session most of these songs sound identical so then i have to ask myself was toxicity really thought out that well or was it let's pick the best ones that sound the best when we have three that sound almost identical cuz i listen to chicken yeah. stew and i'm like it's 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 needles again I listen to IEAIO and I'm like, oh, it's shimmy again, you know. But they're still good. They're still fun. And it I'm, makes you almost wonder how much of that is the band. Because, I mean, I, I think a lot of bands do this, but System of Down, I think, is absolutely notorious for writing just an insane amount of content and whittling it down. It makes me wonder if the band is actually whittling it down and making that choice on these songs sound the same or this is um, tonally off or too goofy for the album, or if it's maybe, uh, you know, Rick Rubin being the genius that he is, kind of giving that uh, that insight into it, and obviously their management and everything else um, kind of makes me wonder how much is outside of the band making that choice and how much was it within and the answer that they would give is the album is called toxicity and we sold a shit ton so there you go <laughs> yeah you know I, I read about that too saying that um the and i think i because i listened to some of the the youtube videos that actually are supposedly the uh the b-sides before they're finished and they definitely sound a lot more raw and uh, a lot less polished um, so, so I read that they basically, once they knew that it had leaked, they had decided to go in and finish, you know, the songs that had leaked and then put it on here. Um, so, so I think maybe it, it could be that they just, they figured if these songs are already out here, let's kind of play off the, that whole culture that was just taking off of, of the torrenting and, um, illegally downloading songs, you know, the opposite of what uh, Metallica was doing at the time. Well, that was the thing. Everybody hated Lars, so everybody else had to try to cash in on it somehow. I thought yep. most people still hate Lars, but hey. <laughs> <sighs> the one song on no here, that, yeah, the one song on here that um, really made me do a double take, uh, mainly because I didn't listen to steal this album a bunch like I did the others, was Ego Brain, and it made me think actually of uh, the Clayman album by In Flames. Oh, interesting. It, yeah, the especially with the acoustic guitar at the beginning. I was like, oh, this sounds like old. The intro, I was like, oh, this sounds like old in flames. <laughs> and, then, well, you know, then search sings, and I'm like, well, it's definitely not. But I was like, oh, this could be a, this totally could uh, show up on an in flames album. That's kind of cool. I mean, yeah. that, that makes it sound a little bit different than some of their past stuff, right? Yeah, it sounded, what was it? I think it's Square Nothingness, I think, is the one I'm thinking of that's making me think of it. 
uh, you know, the intro of it. You know, once he's, like I said, once Surge starts singing, it's definitely not it. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. It, that was the only one that like stuck out to me. I was like, yeah, this is not like the rest uh, on the album. Everything else was like, yeah, this is the, the same stuff. Uh, again, just n- not as good for the most part. And it's like we said, it's because they're B-sides. I mean, they're not supposed to be as strong as Toxicity. But yeah, and I do like the f- I like the fact that you know that they did, you know, go with it and just change the name to you know steal this steal this album. You know, after everything got leaked, I get it, and, and I, I think that was a solid move on their part. You know, just to, you know to go with the flow instead of trying to you know, you know, fight everything that was going on like Metallica did because that just you know. All it did was to just endear themselves to their fans even further. They're saying, hey, you know what? This shit got leaked, and they're cool with it. All right, we like these guys even better. Now we're going to actually go buy the finished versions of the song so we can hear what they're supposed to sound like. Yeah, and the whole idea of doing like that different artwork. Um, Joe, so Joe, you had the uh, just the plain silver uh, CD with like the writing on it. Is that the one that you had? Uh, it was a white label with the writing, and that that's all that was in the case. See, I had the, I had the one that had, like, the I think there were, like, two sets of legs interconnected or intertwined. Have you seen that one? Mm-mm, it's no, It's, like, I have blue not. and red legs. Uh-uh. So that, I think they had five or five or six, like, different covers, and that, that kind of gave it something different, too. So it was just, like, yeah, just like you were saying, Jeff, it gave it, that, like, that vibe of, like, you know, I know I can go out there and get this for free, but I'm since they've kind of done this and they've almost played into that whole vibe like now it makes me like them even more and i want to go support this this that's one of the the last times i actually remember waiting like in line to get an album like waiting for that release time to actually get an album at this place called the warehouse uh back in the days and and then grabbing that album taking it home and like listening to it also one of the last system of down albums that i really got into as well um because as it went into memorize and hypnotize then i although i've heard those albums i definitely haven't heard them to the point where um, things like Toxicity and self title I just know the track listing right off the bat and I kind of know the um, the songs for her. So you waited for Steal This Album? I waited for Steal This Album and I was a bit disappointed and maybe that's what uh, what made me fall off the boat with System of a Down a bit when they went into um, Memorize and Hypnotize. See, I don't know why. I didn't expect it to be anything. So when I listened to it, it was okay. There's some good songs on here. If they played them live, I'd be all right with it. But I'm not. I was never sitting there going, "Oh, when's the next System of an Album? System of an Album? When's the next System of a Down album coming out?" And and then I got this, and I, d- I didn't care. Like I think yeah. System of a Down, and maybe I'm not a super fan. They they always kind of stayed in the middle of my radar. It was oh, they still exist, and that was good enough. You know, then they went away for a while. They came back, and I was like, I w- I was like, oh look. System of a Down is going to play a show, and I don't care because it's good that they can still do that and it sound exactly the same. And for the most part, you listen to them, no matter what song it is or album it is, you're hearing what the band sounds like in rehearsal at the show. That's something that we need more of, and that's something that, that they were doing that no one else really was Everybody else was a little bit more produced or a little underproduced, and they were just very solid. This is what we are. Enjoy. Yeah. Even if it got goofy at times. And I draw the line at goofy, and I probably shouldn't, but <laughs> mesmerize, nice word choice. hypnotize. It's one record. I don't care what anybody says, <laughs> but <laughs> what we got was in, was it 2005? Start of the year, we got Mesmerize. End of the year, we got Hypnotize. Total runtime on Hypnotize is 40. 37 on Mesmerize. So that is a 1 hour and 17 minutes of music. For those that remember CDs back in the day, they typically could hold 120 minutes worth of music. The second record references Mesmerize more than it references itself, so clearly it's one composition. Do we know the reason why they split it? Because I couldn't find anything that was definitive on why they made that choice. We have theories. We were thinking it was because they're trying to get out of a record contract. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if anything, that's the first thing that comes to mind is um, they're trying to get out of a record contract and, and a little bit of maybe an FU to the to the record label, um, you know, take the money and leave type thing. I think uh, Mars Volta had a very similar situation 
um, where the label wasn't going to pay them for an album because they had one song that was essentially like an hour long. So they just broke it up into a bunch of different tracks. <laughs> Um, and this kind of seems like that type of f you to the to the label to say okay we've got we've got two more options let's go ahead and just split up this album into two it, it, it either had to be that or I remember this was that mid 2000s thing this is when if you remember DVDs started because prior to this the majority of DVDs were not being bulk sold so mid 90s through the early 2000s whatever the dvd was that's what it was it it had the film if there was commentary it had commentary if it had behind the scenes everything was on there that was the only option you had in the store cds when dvds started taking off that's when you got the extra disc that had the behind the scenes and the recording and all that extra stuff and the interviews and mudvane comes to mind if you remember the mid two thousand, LD fifty VHS. Listen, uh, I watched it every day. LD fifty VHS, <laughs> the uh, end of all things to come DVD, still one of my favorites. I even remember having the disturbed one. <laughs> I, I I said all of that to say this. This was the mid two thousands where you go to the store, you spend fifteen bucks for the theatrical version, or you spend twenty dollars, you get the director's cut that has all this extra stuff and these commentaries that there's different commentaries than what was on the regular version and then somebody had to sit there and go, ooh, I have to buy both. This was that weird time where they were trying to market a product twice and convincing me to buy it more than once because they still did not want to accept the fact that online digital sales were viable they were still trying to keep it in the physical market. And this that is the most frustrating period of time in recent memory for me because what does the term director's cut mean? That means that the, the film that you gave me is not the film that you shot, which means you're either not in control or incompetent. Or the better one, the unrated version of the film. Unrated, thank you, Kevin Smith, means this is a version of the film that was not reviewed. So you're paying $10 extra for something that only needs one change, regardless of length or content. One change. Saw comes to mind. Five extra seconds of him cutting his foot off. Automatically made it unrated. Get those few extra uh, cuss words in if you're lucky a boob or two. You know, that's... Boobies. Absolutely. That's always better. <laughs> or if no, you know, I, I, I'll tell you what. For direct, if we're going to go on the this whole director's cut thing, there are some directors that it's it's paramount that you see theirs. Those are the minority. Yeah, that's called any film by Ridley Scott prior to 2010. Yeah. Great example of what's not that director. Have you guys seen the uh, director's cut uh, or the alternate endings of Butterfly Effect? Yes. I've heard of. There's a large the, uh, quantity. The cringy moment, and not to ruin it, but this is Spoilers. not in the actual film. Yeah, spoiler alert here. Uh, yeah, for a 15-year-old film. That's okay. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, cover your ears, fast forward 30 seconds, whatever it is. But the the ending on the, uh, the alternate version is as a uh, fetus. He kills himself. He like chokes himself with the umbilical, umbilical cord. cord. Yeah. So he was never born. So all of that movie never happened. Yeah, and that is why that is a deleted scene <laughs> that was not Pay used in the film. Pay your twenty-four bucks and get that scene. I just saved people some money. <laughs> <laughs> I could save you some money with you know all the paranormal activity films, but uh, <laughs> that the, the, waste of money. You mean? Uh, <laughs> That's a waste. I agree. Uh, but this. So was, what you're saying are these two albums are that? This was that time frame because I and I've been trying to come up with a different example, but I know there was more than one group that did the same thing where it was we released two albums in the same year and it was it's clearly just one product that you split in half but this is yep. the one that stands out this is always my example cuz we released two records in the same year so but they both if they both cost 15 bucks well if it's you know, I, half a product it should be 8 bucks but it wasn't yeah he, I think there are bands that probably still do that, but they do it in a way that's less overt. Uh, a good example of something like that, and I love these guys, is uh, Every Time I Die, they released uh, an album. Uh, was it? I want to say it was X Life's. I could be wrong, but they—they they, one of their albums that was within the last three albums, they released the album 
um, and it was you know 10 or 12 songs and then that same year for record store day they released another four songs that were like b-sides from that album um and they packaged it as these were you know especially for record store day i know a lot of bands now are jumping on that you know get these uh remixed remastered unreleased songs b-sides that you could only get on record store day and any day after record store day i'm okay with that i i like collecting vinyl so I, I don't mind having the... Sometimes it's appropriate, but this was that time frame where they were just trying to cash in on it. Yeah, they were trying to get every penny yeah, they yeah. could at that point in time. I get it. So are we yeah. are, are we officially saying then that for the purposes of this episode, Mesmerize, Hypnotize is one album? Well, yeah. I, and I think that was kind of their intention. This was a... You know, this is a... Uh, their melancholy and the infinite sadness. You know, double disc. And it was amazing. So- are there standout tracks on this for you guys though? Because that's the yeah, since I feel yeah. like I fell off the uh, fell off the the wagon or whatever the right term is for this by the time these two albums came out. I've listened through these and and all the guys in American Standards are all um, huge huge System of a Down fans. Uh, it's probably the thing that we listen to most on the road. So I have heard these songs time and time again. But when I think about them, just off the top of my head, the only songs that really come to mind are songs like BYOB or like Lonely Day. But primarily because they've got like the videos and they've they were singles and all that. I yeah, like the deeper ties. cuts. Maybe that makes me a poser. I don't know that I can really name a lot of the uh, the deeper cuts on the album. Although when I hear them, you know, in the van, I'm like, oh, these are still good system songs. Yeah, they they don't have they don't have the the meat the deeper cuts on, on these two. I I think you're right on that. When I said this was the peak of Darren's songwriting, one of the reasons I say that is I'm actually shocked how much vocals are done by Darren. It's almost like Serge took a back seat to a larger composition that Darren had done. Because the further you go in, the more and more it's Darren and the less of Serge you hear. But you mentioned BYOB. I think BYOB is one of the best show openers that has ever been composed. Because it's fast, it's fun, and it adds a groove, which is something that they didn't have very much of prior. And it won, didn't it win the uh, the Grammy for best, uh, was it best video or best song, best performance, something like that. But on this on this whole double album composition, for me, Old School Hollywood's my standout because some something about the way they just enter the song with a synth, slightly different than how most System of a Down songs start. Well, and it's fun, too. They're just talking about all these washed-up Hollywood people, you know, playing in a baseball game. I mean, <laughs> it's pretty funny. I mean, so, I mean, yeah, you know, and that, I guess maybe that's part of the joy, the, the you know, that's what brings people back to, like, the earlier stuff is the fun of it. And, and there's no question that's, that's definitely an old-school Hollywood. So, I, I didn't think this until you actually said that out loud. I wonder... Since Darren made such a big switch on this album to, you know, almost be the the lead vocalist, do you think this by this point there is already a riff built between him and Serge, uh, or already a seed planted that they would go off and do kind of their solo things or their their own projects? Um, so I almost I like I wonder like I, to finish that thought I, I wonder if this album once that happened then after that point it kind of uh, is what caused it or if by the point of the album they were already ready to try to uh, kind of go off and do their own thing i think they were ready to do their own thing already i i, I think um darren had had developed enough of a following of his own that he was he felt like he could go and do his his own thing and then you know in search has such a unique voice you know, the only other person I can think of in you know the '90s and 2000s that you could say has that unique of a voice, you know who it is as instantly as like Les Claypool. I mean, I know it's a different kind of music, but their phrasing was just different than everybody else that was out there. So yeah, I, I just think they were just ready to do their own things and just go their own directions, and and uh, they had to establish themselves. And they, you know, I don't think that's completely unusual for bands, you know, as big as they are, you know that. Everybody wants to go try their own thing. I mean, it's been going on for, you know, decades where 
you know, I, I mean, even just look, I mean, look, the, the Beatles, I guess, are probably the, the most famous example. You know, they all went yep. out and they just became, you know, mega stars on their own as well. But even boy bands do that kind of shit where they're like, oh, yeah, you know, look at Justin Timberlake, you know. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it I feel like it's got to be a mixture of that. Um, like maybe what you were saying earlier, Joe, like they did the same thing for so long. I mean, over 10 years at this point that they didn't feel that they could creatively do something else because they kind of painted themselves into this box. Well, the um, story that I remember, and I say the story I remember because, you know, there's he, he said, she said back 12 years ago, it was Darren was frustrated that he had basically written the last three records in their entirety. Again, what did the last three records mean? Mesmerize, Hypnotize, and Toxicity? Or did it mean Toxicity, Steal This Album, and Mesmerize, Hypnotize as a whole? I don't know. But he was frustrated. He was creatively frustrated. I don't ever remember hearing anything as far as animosity or anything that, like, Surge was like, this guy's trying to take over and be the lead vocalist, so I'm going to go do my own thing. Because Surge ended up pulling a Scott Stapp, a Steve Perry. He went off and did a solo <laughs> Please record. Please don't compare to Stapp. Please. I Please. just yeah. did. Can we edit that out? <laughs> Absolutely not, because I'm the editor. He he went and pulled the same thing. He went to do a solo album, and it sounded exactly like, or the best replication that he could muster, a System of a Down album. It sounded like a mediocre System of a Down record, and I was interested to hear it when it was released. And I think the first thing I heard was just, it sounded like somebody had a, had a piano and was just hitting two keys as fast as they could. And I thought, well, I mean, it, it depends on your level of playability. But then there was another song that had the exact same thing in a different position. And I was like, so does Serge play the instruments on these songs? I, I don't even know that to be honest. He plays, um, or does he have studio guys? He he's a keyboard guy. He plays so, guitar too. He does play guitar a bit. So if you see uh, any keyboard credits on a System of a Down album, it's him. Uh, yep. I don't know that he specifically played guitar, but I know he had a band. Gotcha. But he went way too far. And here's my Serge Tankarian tangent. He did a performance of that mediocre solo album with a full orchestra. They were playing his music off his solo record, and he was standing there doing his Serge Tankarian vocals, and I said, you, sir, have jumped the shark. You are Ingve Malmsteen with a full orchestra and your heavily distorted, way too loud guitar playing way too loud because you're Ingve. Just because you're Serge doesn't mean you get to do this. So was the was he frustrated? I don't know. I don't remember hearing that. I don't remember reading that. But I've noticed that bands that successfully have the same members for any long period of time tend to either take a break or call it quits when they're ahead. And for me, yeah. Mesmerize Hypnotize is clearly Darren is going somewhere. And if he wasn't going to go on his own, I mean, he has to at that point because... What would the next system record sound like? Well, there's supposed to be one coming out soon. Yeah, there's a rumor of it coming out at the end of this year, but who who knows? It's uh, I've been hearing yeah, the you same know, I read thing that. I read Keen. that the um, was it like John said that they were going to um, do uh, which is a weird drummer said that they had a new album that would be out by the end of 2016. But I think it was like Shavo that said that it's not going to happen. Or um, I think I, I feel like John even said that they had like um, you know it written already or they had songs already. Um, so it's kind of interesting that I think within the last few weeks that it's we've heard the opposite, or I've, I've at least seen the opposite that they uh, that they wouldn't be planning for this year. So yeah. I mean, I'm excited. I, I wasn't excited. I, I did want to hear Surge solo. I did want to hear Scars Scars on Broadway, but both of those I felt were missing something. Um, and and I think without those two together, it just didn't have that same appeal. I mean, I can't name any Scars and Broadway songs or any solo songs by Surge. I can't and, either. And knowing that they're out there, I don't have the desire to go and listen to them right now. You know, it just it didn't have that spark or that that magic that the system would have had. Well, I think that's the nail. I it's one of those examples of why is this vocalist and this guitar player so good together? Why are these four? musicians so good together it's because whatever they do together is great and it's enjoyable and it's creative 
Elect so the Dead. That was the name of his record. I couldn't remember it for some reason. <laughs> no, he's got. There you go. I thought he had several. I stopped up. at this one. <laughs> Doesn't he have like That's six, or, like five or six solo albums or something crazy? Is like this that? a Serge Tankian solo project disco- discography discussion, or is this a System of a Down discography discussion? Oh, we got to have a little bit of extra flavor, you know. Gotta have <laughs> this is a, for the patrons. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I I will say one thing. Uh, I I think my uh, my favorite system song is actually Hypnotize. Out, out of out of everything they've done, that's probably my my favorite song. Why is that's that? That's a bold statement. I don't know. It just I think it, what's is funny because I'm not a big lyrical guy, uh, but I'm old enough to remember the whole thing at Tiananmen Square. And uh, I, I think that might be part of it for me. Is uh, it that was the first thing as a kid that I was aware of politically uh, on a global scale, and I, and I just think it just brought me back to being a kid and just you know when he's talking about all that stuff that you know that happens you know waiting for his girlfriend and all that kind of stuff. I was like, uh, you know, it just I guess it just kind of struck a chord with me. Because it was actually the subject manager, subject matter for a change that actually made me want to like that song instead of the the atmospherics, which is complete opposite of what I normally am. I'm normally, you know, I don't listen to the lyrics and I want to I want to get like an emotional high off of the collective whole of the song. But that's why we both like Pantera. <laughs> well, um, yeah, <laughs> throwback. Yeah, I did. I did. Um, yeah, I will just say that. I like Pantera, but Phil's a fucking douchebag. How about that? <laughs> we'll go. We'll go with that. <laughs> and, and, and I'm gonna reel it in before we get completely out of control and say, Jeff, final thoughts on System of a Down. I I like System of a Down. I don't I don't love them, uh, but I think they're fun. I think it's one of the few, you know, quasi metal albums that I can put on around a bunch of people that you know were at a party. And they'll enjoy, you know, whenever they hear BYOB, you know, then they'll have fun with it. And I'm like, all right, so you guys are going to hear something a little heavier, but still enjoy yourself. And so I, that's that's what I, I like about System of the Down. I don't necessarily like all of their political stuff outside of the, hip, you know, hypnotize. I just like how how they make you feel. I like I like the phrasings. I like their the, the harmony. Uh, you know, it's just something different. It's different and, and it's quirky and it's in a good way. Uh, and so I always like having that, you know, it's kind of like a brush of, of fresh air uh, whenever you've been listening to a bunch of, you know, dark, heavy stuff. You know, you throw some system on and you're like, okay, yeah, this is this is fun. Brandon, what about you? No, I completely agree. I think System of a Down, they've always been, I mean, within my probably top 10 or 20 uh, favorite bands of all time. And, and although I did fall off towards the end, I think anytime we put on Toxicity or Self-Titled, um, or even some, to some extent, still this album. I mean, any of those some songs come on in the van or otherwise, and and just like you said, it, it breaks things up. It makes it a, uh, it makes it fun, and it, it makes me respect how different they, um, what they were doing, and when they were doing it at that time. It was, and it's just, I mean, it's a, uh, it's a cool thing to go back to. I'm, I'm excited for the next album. I don't want to get my hopes too high. I want to expect it's going to suck, and then uh, be pleasantly surprised when it comes out. You and me both. <laughs> And I would say on top of what I said earlier, the best artists, the most enjoyable ones for me are the ones that just do the art and don't require that I pay attention. I always find it off-putting when somebody is making a political statement and half of that is, I need to get in your face and make you look at me while I do this. System of a Down is a band that you can listen to, and if you don't want to pay attention to the politics, you really don't have to, because they're fun, and they don't really do anything overly vulgar just to get your attention. You could just sit down, listen to the band, go to a live show. You'll hear about the politics, but it's kind of like listening to Rage. If you don't want to pay attention to the politics, you don't have to, and you can still enjoy it, and it's really good songwriting for the most part and even if you don't find it that interesting it's fun and how many 
heavier punk bands can you think of that are just fun to listen to? Tweet us your answers. That sounds good. Hashtag discuss metal. <laughs> there you go. I want to make sure that anything uh, positive or nice that I said about Dan in this episode gets edited out. Can you do that for me, Joe? Uh, I, know. I don't want to give him a big head, you know. Just I don't I don't know that I said anything overtly, but it's just I don't want him to get a big head and think that I really like, you know, respect him as a person. Just kidding. <laughs> Love you, Dan. Dude, you got any news or anything going on over in the American Standards camp? You know, we we've been trying for a while to uh, say that we're going to stop playing as often locally, but we just keep getting these shows offers um, here in Arizona that we can't turn down because a 16 year old in us gets really excited. Uh, so we've got a bunch of local shows coming up. Actually, um, this uh, Tuesday we're playing, uh, on the 8th we're playing with 100 Sons, which is the guys from Norma Jean, Dead and Divine, and Every Time I Die. They kind of started this new band. Um, so we're doing that. Uh, we've got a couple other shows coming up, um, a couple of Victory Record shows that we're going to announce here in a bit with uh, some Victory Record out artists. Cool. We're planning on a West Coast tour by the end of the year, and then hopefully... Um, Hopefully, beginning of next year, we'll go into the East Coast, and we're already talking about the next album, because everything on Anti-Melody right now feels old to us, you know? Things that we wrote musically two years ago, um, so we're excited to do that, too. And if people have not heard Anti-Melody, where can they hear it? Where can they buy it? Pick it up on Spotify, uh, Amazon, iTunes, pretty much any platform. Uh, the best one is, honestly, to support the band, go to Bandcamp uh, slash American Standards, and you'll find it. Um, that gets us the most bang for our buck when it comes to the money you pay actually goes to the band. It goes to our recording. It goes to our touring. When you buy it on iTunes or Amazon or listen to it on Spotify, we're getting a fraction of whatever you pay. Um, so it's great. I mean, we want people to get it however they can, but if you go to Bandcamp and you uh, buy it on there, that's going to be what helps us the most continue to do what we do. And for every copy that you buy on Bandcamp, Brandon will personally donate a dollar to something. Probably there you go. the food in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or my drinking habit. Well, I got it. All right, one last thing before we go. We tend to do it every week. Uh, Brandon, what have you been listening to this week? What have I been listening to this week? Damn, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm an old man in the sense that I listen to a whole hell of a lot of podcasts well, that's <laughs> outside cool. of a uh, well, that, music. Yeah, Dan, but, um, Dan does podcasts uh, as far as what he listens to too, so that's not a problem. Oh, does he? Yeah, nice, nice. absolutely. So, f- as far as music, I actually just very recently, as much as, and this is going to make me super uncool for any kids that listen to American Standards um, that might hear this, but I never really got into this band Knock Loose. Um, I think aesthetically, they're that kind of um, macho, like tough guy type vibe to the crowd. So I assume that since the crowd is like that, and we've played with them before, and they're starting to really take off, I assume that because the crowd is like that, that the music is like that too, and I've never actually listened to their music. Um, so I pulled it up on Spotify this week, and I've been listening to them ever since, and it's really good music. And I feel like their crowd is the only thing that turns me off, because everybody in the crowd just seems like they're ready to beat the hell out of each other. But the music it's on its own is fantastic, and I, I actually have a lot of respect for them, especially after uh, listening to... Um, Shane from Silverstein, he has a podcast called uh, Lead Singer Syndrome. He had the singer from Knock Loose on there recently. I'm like, oh, this is a really cool guy, really cool down-to-earth guy, and it made me respect him even more. Very cool. What about you, Jeff? What have you been listening to? Oh, I've gone back to my high school days and uh, been listening to Nine Inch Nails. Uh, the new Ad Violence is what I've been listening to. Very nice. So, yeah. I, I Cool. I, got a, I have a, a thing for industrial music, so it kind of kind of scratch that itch for me this week. So I, I, that's definitely what I've been listening to. So anybody who, who likes the old stuff, check it out. It's really, really good. What about you, Joe? Roots, Bloody Roots by Sepultura. Oh. Anti-Melody by American Standards. And because everybody should listen to it anyway, Toxicity by System of a Down. That is what's been on my playlist this week. You know, is that where we hint the fact that we might do a uh, a cover song of uh, I Hear Soulfly or Sepultura? Uh, you know, my my <laughs> suggestion was Refuse Resist. Yeah, yeah, that's what Dan was telling me. If not that, well, we'll talk when the episode's not going about that. <laughs> there you go. You know, I told Dan we actually, Max Cavalera, he used to have a house out here pretty close, a couple miles from where I'm at. So we'd see him at the gas station all the time. He used to go down to this music venue that we play at and just catch local shows. Like, seemed like a super down to earth guy. That's Very funny. Cool. 
And on that note, this has been episode 25 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, iTunes, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please send questions and comments to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal. We have some sweet perks. You can find Brandon and all of the American Standards at Bandcamp and on Twitter. Search for American Standards. I'd tell you what his personal Twitter handle is, but he might come out of that and shock me. <laughs> no, nothing shocking there. And thankfully, the, we stayed at Embassy Suites, and uh, they have an open bar every night from 5.30 to 7.30, so... I had nice. quite a, that sounds like the happiest place on earth. Oh, dude. So much vodka. <laughs> it wasn't even funny.